welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, brighter evening than it was previously at our last seminar in December. Uh, I always enjoy the changing of the seasons. I always talk about the changing of the seasons because we do these roughly quarterly. So <laughs> I always notice the different weather. Um, fabulous. So we're going to get started. Uh, welcome once again to our uh, first Basic Income Conversation seminar of the year. Uh, whether you're joining live or you're joining us on YouTube in the future, um, do introduce yourself in the chat if you are joining us live. Uh, we'd love to hear where you're joining from, what you're interested in, what you're wanting to get from this evening's event. Uh, we do put all of these events on YouTube, so if you haven't already, you can you can head over to our YouTube channel and revisit what we've uh, done in the past. But for this evening, we're really excited to welcome Donald and Ian uh, to, for a discussion about the minimum income standard and uh, what that means for the basic income debate, what, uh, what that can teach us about how we do a basic income. And the seminar series, the purpose of it is to invite experts and explore the more kind of technical components of basic income. We invite experts to share their expertise uh, and to answer some questions from yourselves. So do use the chat box and the Q&A throughout the event uh, to, to pop your questions down as they come up and we will we'll come to them in the sort of second half of the event. I'm going to introduce our speakers or ask our speakers to introduce themselves. Donald, do you want to do you want to say hello? Hello, I'm Professor Donald Hirsch um, from the Centre. I'm director of the Centre for Research in Social Policy at Loughborough University, um, and our team is the one that puts together this thing called the Minimum Income Standard, which I'll tell you about in a bit. Um, and we do that with funding for, um, from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, um, and have been doing that for for the last ooh, since back. Back in 2006 is when we first launched the project. So 15 years we've been we've been doing this. That's Fantastic. me. Thanks, Donald. And Donald's our man for minimum income standards. So he'll be explaining what that is in just a few moments. And Ian is our other speaker of the evening. Ian Porter, do you want to introduce yourself? Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Good evening. Um, I'm Ian Porter. Um, I've led uh, the social security policy work at the Joseph Roundtree Foundation or JRF for the last three years, so not quite as long as JRF has been funding Donald to work on MIS. Or MIS. Um, but yeah, I've come from a background before that in kind of um, policy work in charity sector and child poverty. Um, and I suppose relevant particularly to this to this evening's debate, um, I've also worked in the policy unit um, at Westminster, one of our national political parties where um, uh, uh, a universal basic income was um, considered amongst social security policies. Thank you, Ian. Fantastic to have you both here. Uh, we also have Lena, um, who will introduce herself to. Hi, folks. I'm Lena. I'm the Campaigns and Projects Officer at Compass and Basic Income Conversation, and I will be dealing with the Q&A afterwards, facilitating all of your questions. So please feel free to stick them in the chat as they occur to you or save them up and, and we'll get to them in the last half of the session. And we'll be inviting you to come on microphone or on camera to um, to ask those questions if you want to. So do keep an eye out for a message from Lena, who will uh, yeah message you to to invite you to do that later on if we're going to uh, invite your question to speakers. So just a bit of context. I'm not going to do. I'm not going to attempt to introduce minimum income standard before handing over to to Donald. But um, just a bit of context of why we wanted to have this conversation tonight. Why we wanted to host this event. And part of that is the kind of theme that we're wanting to explore through the seminar series this year is how a basic income could fit into our social security system. So to think a bit in a bit more detail about how it, where it actually slots in and, and what it needs to look like to, to function. And we wanted to start here with the minimum income standard because it really is a sort of pivotal, incredibly useful piece of research here in the UK because it gives us an idea of, of what's needed, of what's adequate. Uh, so we have a benchmark of how far away we are from that. Um, so we know what we're aspiring to, rather than kind of being told this is what you're getting and, and that's, you know, what it's going to look like. You can, you can t uh, tinker around the edges of that. Um, this is about what is adequate. What do we actually need to, to live a good life? And that indeed is the whole purpose of a social security system, is to guarantee a certain standard of living universally to everyone. Um, and the minimum income standard puts a number to that which is particularly useful to the basic income debate because it deals with money and, and we deal with money. So it's a useful comparison, uh, a useful thing for us to factor in when we're thinking about basic income. And when you look into how it's calculated and, and how, how that number is reached, it also allows, allows us to have more meaningful debates about how basic income fits into the social security system, the system as a whole. 
you know, to think about things like services uh, or, you know, universal basic services, which, you know, is often posed as an opposing idea to, to basic income, which we very much don't agree with. Like it, it helps us understand how significantly what is needed for a minimum standard of living uh, changes from an income perspective when you gain or lose access to some of your basic needs by services. Um, and yes, so a minimum income standard has, has been very usefully applied to talking about eliminating poverty. So again, really happy to have Ian here to kind of look at that side of things and, and again, have a really lucid debate about the role a basic income can actually play in, in something as massive as eliminating poverty. So I'm gonna hand over to, to Donald now to give us the, the scoop on the minimum income standard and explain, explain what that is and how it's reached. Yes, well, I'll, I'll say a few things about MIS and also how it, it relates to UBI and MIG, minimum income guarantees. That's three acronyms um, which I'll have to explain. Um, a minimum income standard um, is the amount that a household needs to, um, to, to, to live on according to what members of the public think is adequate. And what that's based on is um, regular research that we do bringing together groups of members of the public to ask them about the things that would need to go into a household budget, which we then cost. Um, and what we ask specifically is um, what people would need as a minimum defined as being what, what's required both for the basics like food, clothing and shelter, and also having um, the choices and opportunities that you require to participate in society. So it's more than, it, it includes the essentials. And of course, there's been a lot of focus on that now, I mean, the essential material things, but it also means um, that a child has, isn't unable to go to a birthday party because they can't bring a present and that a family is never ever able to have any kind of leisure or go on holiday. And where you draw those lines, um, are not decided by us as experts, but by members of the public in, in discussion. And there's an enormous amount of consensus that, that is reached and it's based on, on, on consensual conversations, which gives it a lot of credibility because people do agree that, for example, you, you, know, you, you can't have a decent life in, in, in Britain today if you never can afford to go on holiday, even to the seaside for a week, a year. And then they talk about where there's a difference between things which are which are just nice to have and things you actually need to have in that in that sense. Um, so um, as Claire was saying, we, we do actually then turn that into a number by costing it up. And, it, and it's of course, it's different um, for different um, household types. So, you know, it's obviously not the same for a big family as it would be for a single person. So we have all, we publish all, all that data every year. Um, it's used, it's still a lot of, of applications, including, um, for the real living wage, which is based on, 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 on that research. But the, the important thing in, in, in relation to um, universal basic income is just how different that level is from the current safety net. And it's getting worse. And you, you're probably aware from everything you've heard just you know, in real time in the last few weeks that it's continuing to get worse. Um, so for a family with children, you used to, if you were, if you didn't have any, any earned income of your own if you were unemployed. Um, when we started off, you, 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 it, it provided about two thirds of what you need, and it's now gone down to little over half. And, and the figures we bring out this year might, it might even fall to below half of what you need. So, so you know, we don't have anything that's close to that now. And we also don't have a stable relationship between the, between the safety net and, and um, those requirement incomes. It's worse for if you don't have children, it's it's gone down to barely a third of what you need, um, the, the benefits. And it's a lot better if you are a pensioner where, where, where you have the pension credit guarantee where it's, well, it's probably around 90% now. That, that is to say, you, you just can't get quite get to the minimum income standard um, purely through means tested benefits, but you can nearly get there. And of course, we, we have a single tier um, pension being, um, introduced, which also gets very close to that level. So it, it also varies a lot and, and, and it's, it's worse for people who are working age and their children than it is for pensioners. So that's minimum income standard. Um, universal basic income, as I expect people here know, is, is an unconditional payment for everyone. Um, and 
could you bring it could you set it at that level it would be extremely expensive and very ambitious um minimum income guarantee my third acronym um is a universal um but unconditional guarantee delivered through a targeted payment and i use that definition um because it's been used interestingly in scotland where there was a huge movement to try to sort of look into whether you could have an adequate um, minimum uh, universal basic income. And that has kind of turned, interestingly, within the last year into um, a, 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 the idea that no, it's just not feasible. But you could actually, you, you can actually seek to have um, a, a guarantee. Um, at around the level of the minimum income standard, that's explicit, um, and the and the IPPR Institute for Public Policy Research has, has has come up with a paper for that, and the Scottish government is trying to move in that direction. But that's saying you can you can do that, but not for everyone, but just to have a targeted payment to make sure that everyone gets there. But it's not a payment that's paid automatically to everyone. Um, so. Um, a few years ago, I, I wrote a, a paper which said, look, it's a lovely idea, universal basic income, but it's just not unrealistic because of two huge problems. One is the enormous tax rates you need to have to be able to fund it, marginal tax rates. And, you know, we can see that the British don't like high tax rates. I mean, no, nobody likes high tax rates, but we, the last person to actually explicitly um, raise income tax was a man called Dennis Healy back in 1975. Um, and that even when they do it, like through, through, through national insurance, they have to do it in a hidden way. So it's a huge ask to sort of say people would have, accept what I think would have to be about sort of at least about 50% marginal tax rates rather than 20%. Um, and, and, and also that's with, with abolishing the, the tax allowances. Um, they're different, there are different calculations, but it, all of them look horrendous. Um, and the other, and the other point, which perhaps is more wiggle room on, but but which is still very difficult, is 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 the uncon is making it unconditional. Um, again, the, the the British public seem to quite like the idea that you don't get something for nothing, and 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 the politicians have always play that, um, and that you have to, that it will be conditional. But that's something which there may be more wiggle on. Um, so that so if you just go for a UBI, you 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 require both those huge changes at once. And my real concern about it has been that that there's, there's been a lot of pressure, there'd be a lot of pressure to say, well, let's start by with a, with a quite a low level, but we'll have top ups, means tested top ups. So you kind of think, well, what's, what exactly is that achieving? You've still got the complexity. Um, and the, the risk always is that people think, well, there's, you've got universal basic income, that's enough. And that, and that other things are eroded and particularly um, that People's entitlements aren't very sensitive to need because people think, well, you've got that, go away and 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 make it work. Um, so, really, um, the, the 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 good thing I think is about the um, ab ab about the debate though is that it's actually opened up some some very important issues. Which I think can be tackled partly through um, a, an adequate minimum guarantee. Um, the first is about conditionality and about and about um, whether you whether you do need to have the, the sort of carrots and sticks of of, of work conditions. Um, and a lot of the research or the experiments around um, basic income, I think, have been was not really about sort of full basic income system, which is fully paid for through a tax system, because they haven't been doing that. They've been much more selective um, experiments about looking at whether people need to be forced to work in order to be able to ha have the incentive. And, 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 and I think those, those are very good, but that, that can be applied, um, that, that, that can be applied to something which, which reduces the conditionality and, and is, is, is more, um, is, it helps, it gives people sort of more stability without it really being universal. Um, and that's the way that the Finnish system of uh, the experiment and, and, and the one in Rotterdam, I think, have, have um, for example, worked. Um, 
And so, the, 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 but another principle, uh, as well as the, the, the sort of carrots and sticks and conditionality, I think it's about stability. I mean, what's really wrong with, with the universal credit, I don't think is its structure, but it's, but it's meanness in terms of the, when it's paid, how it's paid, how it doesn't actually provide stability um, for people who need it. Um, and I think there's a huge um, scope for redesigning effectively universal credit to make it much more tolerant and much less sensitive to, to um, immediate changes in, in, in increase in income, especially, especially because of the people who, who, who are most in need of, of help often have unstable incomes. And, and if you constantly sort of messing around with what they're getting from the state, they, they don't have a sort of stable basis to, to, to build on. Um, and, and so th those are two, those are two sort of things we, that it made us think about. But the third thing it's made us think about, which is in a way what, what Clear has introduced today is adequacy, which is, are you actually providing people with a baseline, which is enough um, for human dignity? Um, and as, as we've said, uh, the minimum does actually give an, an, an idea of that, but it's a lot higher than the present safety net. And I think the problem we've got when we look at our present system isn't just um, that, that we, you know, it, 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 that it, for example, seems to stigmatize people if you, if you target, but, it, but it's, it's also that if you start with something which isn't sufficient and then you start taking it away when, when people start earning, then that, that is much tougher than I think if you do start with something sufficient. And my proposition is um, that if we could tackle um, these three features of the system as sort of kinder um, form of conditionality or none at all, um, something which really provided you with stability so things weren't constantly being sort of taken away um, as soon as you started earning, um, and an adequate starting point, then other features of the system would feel more just. And there was a particular one, which is the elephant in the virtual room at the moment, which is means testing. Um, I think that if you had a guaranteed dignified income, it would make it more acceptable that once you start replacing it with your own earned income, that that, that, that gets taken away quite, quite quickly, is what means testing is. Um, and this would be less brutal if you had what we call benefit run on, which means that there, that is the moment your circumstances change, you have a, a, a period of, of grace where you continue to get to get a steady income, which is so different from what it is now. Um, so, yeah, so I think that having this with less conditionality or even no conditionality would make it easier for people to make choices, for example, families to make choices about about how to contribute, about, about how you contribute to society. Is it, is it the balance between family caring, um, for example, and, and earn, earning your income and not having such a huge difference in, 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 in your, your well-being and starting with, a, starting with a, a guarantee that you've got something which, which represents dignity would be, would be a great thing to have. So there we are, that's a redesign of the social security system in 10 minutes. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I've uh, been quite harsh about the sort of overall um, pure universal basic income um, concept, and I'm sure I'll, 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 take, I'll be asked to take questions about that. Thank you so much, Donald. Um, we'll pass on to, to Ian now. He can do his bit and we'll come, come for questions, as you say. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, a great uh, opener to the debate there um, from, from Donald. Uh, much there that I would agree with um, and I'll build on, uh, but maybe a few things uh, I don't necessarily need to agree or might suggest a different angle um because otherwise that would be too boring if we just if i said all the same things as donald um but so yeah um donald nicely explained what the miz is um just to helpfully put a basic figure around that to have in our heads um you know for a single working age adult excluding what you'd need to spend on rent and childcare, that would be about 230 pounds per week um from you know JRS perspective, we our mission is to solve UK poverty or, or to create the conditions where we have a UK that is prosperous without poverty. Um, the MIS doesn't define poverty, 
um, we would define poverty is when your resources are well below what's enough to meet your minimum needs, um, including to participate to a reasonable degree in society. Um, it means falling substantially short of a decent standard of living. Um, and uh, I just, just wanted to make that clear because, as, as Donald would say, the, the MIS research doesn't sort of ask people, what do you think poverty is? Um, it's a bit of a different concept. But um, if, you know, poverty, I wouldn't say it's not fundamentally defined by a sort of an income line um, but you know there, there's no best sort of measure of poverty um, that can perfectly capture what what poverty is but uh, you know a commonly used indicator of the sort of income that where you might expect a risk a high risk that someone is experiencing poverty is um, an income of a household income of less than 60 percent of the median household income after housing costs and um, so that would be again for a single adult around 160 pounds per week so about eight and a half thousand pounds a year so you can see quite a bit less than the MIS. Um, Jeriff also does um, has done a lot of research on like the real the sharpest end of poverty, what we call destitution, that really is, you know, not being able to afford the bare essentials of life, um, the essentials we all need to eat, to stay warm, to stay dry and keep clean, um, a much more harsh basic level of adequacy. Um, and just to kind of, again, it's, it's not fundamentally defined by income, it's, it's, it's about being, not, not having access to those basic things, but um, our research kind of does put an income, rough income level to that. Again, for a single adult, that would be around 70 pounds per week. So you kind of see these different, different um, income adequacy uh, yardsticks, I suppose. Um, so MIS is an income level, um, but it says nothing really about the quality of that income, um, about the variability of that income, the certainty of that income, nor the source, the source of that income. Um, and so thinking about that, I, I, my understanding of a basic income, I know this will set off a huge debate in itself amongst um, uh, amongst people watching here what you know what's the definition of a basic income but i would take a broad definition as basically being um something a, a, a regular income that someone receives without any conditions um and that doesn't depend at all on what other the rest of your income or, or wealth um and um but it doesn't really say anything about necessarily fully where that comes from it's just that it's not in return for performing any work or performing any sort of behaviours upon which conditions are set. Um, so it's, it, it's that's quite a broad but basic definition. And um, thinking about the MIS then, um, the MIS is uh, that is strictly a level of income. Um, I'd say it's not strictly necessary, obviously, to have a basic income to achieve a MIS for everyone. Um, you know, all that's necessary there is a policy framework that ensures that income from various sources, when combined, um, for example, from work and social security, are enough to meet that minimum income standard. And Donald referred to the concept of a minimum income guarantee. Um, so that's probably what that kind of sums up. Um, and, and also for some families already, the MIS research shows, you know, families on low incomes are already able to achieve the minimum minimum income standard under our current policy framework um when for example a family with two uh, a family a couple with two children who are both working on the minimum wage floor um full time will just about when combined with their universal credit payments be just above the minimum income standard level so we've achieved it for that scenario under the, the, the this combined policy package that we have um, so basic income is certainly not necessary to achieve a MIS, but um, there's one thing as Donald set out, and I would say, you know, from all the work that we do at JRF, it's absolutely clear that the basic means-tested social security payments levels, um, particularly for those out of work, are wholly inadequate at the moment um, when compared to MIS, even when compared to the poverty line, or even for some people, if you compare it to that destitution line of what you need to just get the bare essentials of physical life. Um, so if you're a, an adult um, uh, who's under the age of 25 um, without children, 
excluding the housing support that you might get, that basic universal credit allowance that you get, it, it will be £61 per week. Um, compare that to just, the, just over £70 a week um, of that destitution level. Um, so, you know, um, what, 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 what role could a basic income have in achieving this? Um, why would you use a basic income? Um, well, I, I bring it back to maybe what it's about is the quality of that income rather than the level of that income. Um, so, you know, Donald's kind of mentioned issue, means testing, conditions. Um, it's a constant thread that we see all the time. Um, the, the things like stigma that people face, um, the feeling of being interacting with a system that, that um, doesn't treat you with any dignity or respect, um, the problems that causes and is related to things like low awareness, complexity, difficulty to access the system, particularly the case difficulty accessing support um, in a timely manner when people when you really need it and you know many people need to call on our social security protection at, uh, when they're going through huge turmoil in their lives um, and having to jump through loads of hoops and facing errors and delays and problems at that point um, just compounds things or, or, or even or in worse it becomes the, the core problem um, and it, and even for people in work as, as Don said um, I'd say with universal credit itself um, much of our work has shown this overly um, dynamic nature um, where people experience um, very uh, huge fluctuations in in their in their universal credit payments and so for people experiencing these situations um, it's not just about the level of income people value certainty security stability and I've always been struck by speaking to someone um, when I worked um, on child poverty um, by someone saying how their kind of life fell apart when their relationship broke down and they had to leave their home with their children and they went for weeks and weeks with basically no income whatsoever and, and they said they were so grateful for their child benefit it was their savior um, in that period um, and, and child benefit you know i'd say is probably the closest thing we have to a basic income in our current system and possibly possibly the state pension if you've um, got a good contribution record once you get there um, but but basically you know it it was the child benefit was so important because it was dependable, um, it was unconditional, it was non-means tested, uh, but probably most importantly, it was fundamentally, it was already there, it was already in place, they were already receiving this regular amount before they hit problems um, since applying for it years earlier. Um, so that's always kind of struck me. Um, could you fix some of these problems by having a basic income, at a minimum income standard? level um i mean you could um but what kind of changes would 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 be needed to make that happen um uh, yeah donald's already mentioned kind of um, there have been a lot of studies looking at you know if you wanted to introduce a basic income in a, in a fiscally neutral way so kind of um, no no impact on the government budget as a fair starting point um using higher income tax rates to sort of balance off the net cost of that basic income, um, even after you account for the fact that that basic income would replace large parts of the existing benefits and tax system, such as um, including sort of um, proposals, a lot of which now would propose replacing the personal tax allowance and national insurance um, allowances. Um, you know, one study found, I think, some modelling that, you know, to, to, to bring in a mid, a mid level basic income, would see all tax rates rise by 48 percentage points. Um, other studies, you know, have to, with kind of such high increases in tax rates, you've got to start thinking about the sort of dynamic effects of that as well, not just that, but that, that's just a static modeling. Um, for example, you know, raising income taxes, all else equal, will, will, will tend to lead to lower labor supply, um, lower economic output. So um, there is a genuine question that's been asked, is it even possible to run an economy with a very, very high basic income funded by income taxes? Um, a couple of studies have looked with that and um, ultimately confirmed it is perfectly possible to do that. Um, the economy could sustain that, um, i.e. it 
having the, the tax rates necessary to introduce a very high level of basic income wouldn't kind of um, um, deplete your um, economic output um, to enough that you couldn't actually fund that basic income. So it's possible, it's perfectly possible, but you would need very high tax rates and you couldn't do it just by only raising taxes on the most affluent. You'd have to ha raise those taxes on lower and middle income people as well. Um, so, I, you know, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say it's not possible, but I actually see the main barrier as public reluctance to accept high marginal tax rates um, as the biggest barrier. Um, I think lots of um, public attitude studies show um, that no one's going to vote for that anytime soon. Um, but what if the key benefit of a basic income is not about the level of income being at that level, at the mere level or even the poverty level, but about providing at least a semblance of a much secure, better quality income at a lower level? Um, and JRF has been doing a lot and will be doing a lot more work on the, the real destitution end of the spectrum um, uh, um, over, the, over the coming years. Um, and you know, that, that leaves a question about a lot of the issues facing people that kind of are the final trigger point into destitution are problems like delays um, and issues accessing the benefit system at the point of need. Um, so it, it does beg the question of if you, there was a, even a very small payment of sort of nearer the destitution level, um, is that where you're going to get the most value um, out of a basic income, um, given that um, the public is just not going to be willing to um, fund a much higher level, but could that still be valuable? Um, the same modelling that I mentioned earlier, I think, um, suggested that a basic income at around the £80 per week level could be done um, by raising um, all in, uh, tax rates by around three percentage points. Um, plus the other big changes I've mentioned, like completely eliminating personal tax allowances. So, um, yeah, I'm, I think I'll just kind of leave it there and hopefully that will um, lead us into a, a bit of a nice discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ian. Thanks to us both. Um, I think uh, that idea of quality of income is a really interesting one. I've not, not heard it phrased that way before, but I do think that that's kind of the crux of it. Um, do put your questions in the chat and in the Q&A. We're going to be moving on to your questions very soon, so make sure that you're, you're getting them down there. People often get, we get a flurry of questions right at the end, so make sure you're putting them in as soon as possible so we can come to you uh, as we're, we're balancing the time that we have questions uh, rather than rushing at the end. Um, I just want to say a couple of bits from the perspective of uh, sort of basic income advocate, from the perspective of the basic income conversation, and I think the word guarantee is something that's, you know, that's been repeatedly said through through both of these presentations. And I think, I think sort of something that makes basic income really appealing is sort of, you know, a knowledge of the culture of means testing. There's a lot of really sort of open discussion in the chat here of people's personal experience of the, the means test of means testing and the social security system and how inadequate and punitive that can be. So I think there's a real suspicion of, of means testing, um, but also just a real acknowledgement that guaranteed income, guaranteed security is not something that we currently have much access to. And that sort of the universality of basic income is, is what, you know, the, the idea of preventing anyone from slipping through the cracks completely, you know, and, and the discussion about how much they would be uh, landing on is, is up for, for grabs with the level of basic income. Um, but I do think that's a really key part of this, the, the, the sort of argument for universality um, being the, the sort of uh, a true safety net or an income floor, as, as people sometimes talk about, uh, but also the, the unconditionality being, being this sort of compassionate, this, this different kind of system. Um, yeah, and, and I just wanted to acknowledge as well, as the basic income conversation, we've always been really interested in having a, a big debate about what a basic income should look like and what it should represent. So again, I think this is where there's a real parallel with the minimum income standard, the fact that that research is really based on, on public opinion. So we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but yeah, I also wanted to mention the sort of, I think uh, uh, there's two sides to, to the conversation that we're having tonight and so two sort of challenges that I want to pose. And I think one of them is the idea that the, ba that the basic income debate and, and promoting the idea of a basic income is an opportunity to push um, you know, both government, but also organizations like the Joseph Roundtree Foundation to, to think more, to think, to think more long-term, to think big and, and, and sort of maybe ignore some of the, or not ignore, but um, 
work with or around some of the assumptions we have on um, you know, public opinion in comparison to what we would achieve with a policy like basic income and, and maybe that it's worth uh, talking about it anyway. Um, and then for us, people that are already quite convinced on basic income that want to, to see it implemented, to engage open-mindedly with the conversations that are being had by, by organizations like JRF again and, and around the minimum income standard to acknowledge that you know we really are trying to achieve a common goal here maybe it's you know maybe we're more being more specific about the policies that we have or we're, we're quite prescriptive or territorial about the policy that we want which is a, a basic income for many reasons many valid reasons but also that fundamentally what we're trying to do here is guarantee a standard of living to everyone in the UK and if we have allies in in the shape of people that will turn up and have interesting conversations with us we should um we should be generous with them. So I hope that, that yeah, anyway, so that's, that's enough for me. I was really, I mean, Donald, I'd be keen to hear a little bit more about the process uh, that you go through to, to understand what, what that shared understanding of what is adequate, uh, what that looks like in, in defining the minimum income standard. Well, we, um, what we do every two years is we have a, a, a series of very intensive uh, groups where um, you have a sort of, six, eight, ten people in a room um, and they might be single people discussing what 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 do you what does somebody who is single in 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 the UK need and we sort of build up a kind of scenario about how they would need to live. Um, and these groups initially will will be a full day a full day event where you go into every single detail about sort of well what would they you kind of go through an imaginary house or flat and say, you know, what, what would they need in the kitchen? How many teaspoons would they need? Um, and, you know, the bedroom needs to be the clothing, the socks, and then you think about what they would need out of the, out of the house in terms of participation. And so it's it's kind of building a picture of what it means to, to, to live with dignity. And, and we will go through several iterations of this where one group will come up with a list through collaboration. And then you take that list to another group to sort of check back whether it's with just the quirk of, of the first one. Um, and we have sort of three three stages for an, an, any one um, what we call household budget. Um, and then we go out and sort of well, we don't actually go out anymore. We do it more online, sort of um, all the costings of all, all all the different things. And you know, but and of course this year, you know, things like the sort of rising price of fuel will be you know absolutely central to that. Um, but we also see how things change over time and, and, and how, you know, things that people sort of say, oh, well, you need a mobile phone, that's not necessary. Or well, they might have done some years ago. And at what point does that actually become so much part of, of everyday life? You actually need it to communicate and, and, and socialise and to, and to function in society. Um, so we're kind of tracking what's happening over time. Thank you. Sounds fascinating. <laughs> I'd love to, to be a player in the world. Um, and Ian, you talked about the... Um, the sort of the other sums of money which are these much lower sums of money that look at the the sort of sharp end of poverty and um, is it a similar process that you go through to to identify these or is it is it more sort of modeling um how did you go about yeah um sim uh, sorry ju just one thing to clarify about the, my suggestion of um thinking about uh, a basic income at the a destitution level is obviously um, that would be within keeping um, the existing uh, means tested benefits around it. So obviously people would get would, would still get <laughs> um, a lot more than, than just that basic level. It's just that uh, that basic portion would be guaranteed, certain, stable and um, always, um, always coming in. Um, th but, but yeah, thinking about that destitution level, we, we fund similarly um, academics um, at Loughborough University to um, do um, uh, a kind of study where we, um, the, the main purpose of it is to, to, to try and get a good um, robust estimate of how many people across the UK um, could be classed as, as being below uh, experiencing destitution. So as part of that, obviously you, you need a definition and the research team there um, came up with a methodology um, when the first study was done um, about, when was it, 2015, I think. Um, again, based on partly on um, public consensus about what, um, what those essential items are um, in destitution and then um, 
the prices of those items are sort of updated each each year of the study but it's also based on <clears throat> sort of a combined with um again um looking at data on what the bottom uh people in the bottom 10 percent of income in the country actually spend on those items as well as um a sort of a, a public again a public opinion based poll of what they think families in this in with their particular um set up would need to to not be in destitution so it's a bit of a combined methodology but it's it's again yeah based on uh, a, a robust sort of um academic methodology sorry i think i said loughborough university but that wouldn't that would be um <laughs> that would be donald again um no it's um academics at heriot watt for the destitution study oh, is that my end i'm in edinburgh uh, my neighbours. Um, yeah, I think, again, this is um, this is why this research is so crucial to what we're trying to do here, because it represents, no, it puts numbers to what we're trying to describe when we talk about quality of life, when we talk about the sort of varying degrees of quality of life as well, you know, that here's two ends of, um, of, of amounts of sums of money that, that would have a really different impact that would, you know, provide a, a, a certain level of comfort or security or quality of life, but um, yeah, we should be thinking about what we're what we're asking for. And, and again, the minimum income standard feels like the right thing to be asking for in the modern world in in, in the UK. Um, one final point for me, because there's lots of really interesting things happening in the chat and the Q&A. So uh, do keep putting your questions in there and we'll start asking people to come on, on microphone and on camera to ask those questions in a moment. Um, but you made the point that there's a lot of consensus on what's needed throughout this process that people people reach consensus on on what quality of life looks like in these conversations but also that they seem to reach consensus on strong opinions about conditions on these this kind of support being necessary or income tax not being um something that they want to see increase and i think these things are at odds with each other because if we're saying this policy will provide a certain quality of life that you agree with but uh but you have but you know, working through a process of, of changing the way we apply conditions and the changing the way we tax people in the country. Uh, yes, comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, well, I mean, the thing is that we very intentionally, when we do these groups, we don't talk about, as Ian said, wh wh where the money is coming from. And because when you do that, you just create division from the start. People have different, we don't talk about poverty, we don't talk about deservingness we say what is your, what are your needs we're trying to get we're trying to sort of think about what people's needs are so they don't we don't say whether this person is working or not for example you know it's, it's what we you know what do you actually need for, to, to dress respectively whether you're working or not and 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 so it's remarkable how the, the conversations that we're creating um shows that there is a consensus about need if you can strip those things out you can then take those things and then we can agree and probably disagree about the means of getting there and you know i i think that a lot of people in this chat are agreeing with each other but there are there's probably a different audience that would disagree with them um and so that is harder i i i, I but but, it, but we wouldn't ever get to this point of saying you need 200 and something pounds a week if we if we started off by by asking the question in that sort of deserving this way, because you get you get you get a lot of shouting, I think. Agreed. And maybe there's we don't need to be too scared of shouting, but yes. Um Ian, did you have anything you wanted to add on that? Obviously, that's a big part of the work that, that you do as an organization, trying to move that conversation to a more productive place. Yeah, that's right. I mean, JRF has for um funded quite a lot of work on kind of public attitudes and public narrative um we've funded work around the concept of what we call framing um which is kind of what we've tried to um you know it's identifying this point that actually um so you know studies like donald's identify consensus actually on on what people need um, and what people view as an acceptable living but but the um, the difficulties arise in in how how our society should achieve that um and yeah so so we we've we've identified that that is a key barrier and blocker to change and that's why we funded work on what are more constructive productive ways about talking about poverty that don't um that, that tap into consensus in society uh, and you and you do see consensus around um kind of justice and compassion and values like that it's how do you um how do you 
get buy-in for solutions and make things happen that can tap into where we have consensus rather than go off down ways that kind of create unproductive division from the start and get nowhere. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to pass over to Lena to, to get some, some questions asked so we can hand over to, to you all again. Uh, keep popping your questions in. I think we're, we're getting to 45 minutes worth of questions already. So do, do get your questions down. Lena. Hi. Um, yes, do keep putting your questions. I'm checking both the Q&A and the chat. I will be collating some of them together just because they overlap. Um, and I want to uh, give our panels the you know, the most time to answer the questions. Um, so the first question I'm going to bring in, I'm going to bring in Marilyn to ask a question about individuality versus household payments. Marilyn, you should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, I find the uh, discussion so far really interesting, but I did notice that um, people haven't mentioned the individual aspect that's one of the five features of universal basic income. And it struck me that that's quite important in relation to means testing, because um, means testing certainly traditionally has been on the basis of the household. So the um, income and savings of both partners in a couple are assessed together. Um, and with something like a minimum income guarantee, if it would be going up to the um, minimum income standard level, then that is that could bring a lot of people into means testing. Um, but actually, there's no individual entitlement. So I was just wondering if there were any ideas about um, how the individual aspect, as well as some of the other discussions about conditionality and universality, could be um, considered. So, for example, maybe some kind of partial basic income, which um, would then allow individuals to have something, even if that doesn't necessarily go up to the uh, minimum income standard level. So it's a way of saying, is there something which isn't uh, just a one size fits all, but is there a little package of different approaches that could be considered? Thank you. Great, thank you, Marilyn. Should I answer that? Please do. Um, very nice to see you, Marilyn, after many years. Um, yes, the, the problem is that if you make it individually based, then it becomes more expensive to meet everybody's needs. Because, for example, you give what you give to um, to an indiv to two individuals who are a couple um, would be greater than you would you would give if you just gave it gave them a, a couple amount that that acknowledged economies of scale of two people living together. I mean, the problem is that I mean, my my concept of minimum income guarantee is really something like universal credit, more kindly um, and, and and constructively administered, but but basically set at a level which is which is a something like the minimum income standard and and yes if you wanted to do that sort of on, on the basis of individual entitlement it would just be more expensive or you'd have the people you'd leave people short i mean i i don't quite understand the individual um argument in this case given that it is less because given that there are economies of scale um it just feels as though there's a lot of i mean i know that i know there's an i i know there's a a lovely concept of sort of feeling that you that you as an adult have have an entitlement as an individual but it's a very these things i mean what, what i'm proposing and what i'm suggesting which isn't going the full way to um to to a universal basic income but one which is means testing is still incredibly expensive because it it's it, it's it's incredible you, you have to raise an enormous amount more money to make the system adequate because we, because of as we've said it's so inadequate and so each thing you do like that which is and you know quite nice but expensive it just makes it more expensive still um and so i guess that i'm a bit i i'm i'm maybe i'm a bit of a of, of a means testing extremist here um in the sense that i actually think that the basic principle we have now um of means testing is necessary and it has to be on a household basis because otherwise it's too expensive and by the way somebody wrote in the chat about so it isn't means testing just putting putting power into the hands of um, of civil servants. Well, it doesn't have to. I mean, when we tax people on income tax, that's a, that's a form of means testing, and we don't sort of 
called the civil servants tyrants. I mean, if people have been tyrannical about the way that, that it's been run, and that's based on conditionality, then we should have less conditionality and, and, and more, and more, more of, of the sense of an automatic entitlement. Um, but I don't think means testing in itself is any more tyrannical than income tax. Perhaps, yes, that's um, right. Ian, you carry on. Yeah, just to come in on that, um, I think means testing probably is, to be fair, at least slightly more tyrannical than um, the tax system. Um, and that's partly because of the household basis of it, um, ra rather as opposed to the individual basis of the tax system, because um, it does start to introduce basically the more complicated it gets, the more factors that have to be brought into the, the test against your income, you know, the more points there are for um, errors to occur and things to go wrong. Um, so um, having to, you know, people do come unstuck by um, having to sort of prove who they're partnering up with um, in, in a household means test. Uh, problems occur when partnerships break up and you move into different circumstances and, and that just doesn't happen with an individual based system so I think to provide a slight counter counterweight to, to, to your um, means testing um, devotion there is it is worse it, there are more problems there are more things to go wrong on a household basis um, and you know that's why there's you know you, got, you would say there is there's got to be some there is some value in, in a purely individual based entitlement but, but it's a it's a, f a genuine difficult and fair question say how much is that worth um for the 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 cost of that which which you're right you know household means testing that is more efficient in a cost sense because um you know frankly a couple needs needs less money than a, than two separate individuals to 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 live um so but you know it, there's not a simple sum you can do because what is the value of again the quality of the income that you have when done on an individual basis um you know, i don't have <clears throat> an answer to that but um marilyn's suggestion i guess is that there's enough value in that that at least a small component of the system that is an individual entitlement um gives you give, give, you know is worth it um uh, i suppose my suggestion of a, of a very low payment is that the kind of um the benefits of that are 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 quite great or potentially quite great at small levels um but then once you start you know trying to provide more and more and more through an individual system the benefits of that, the gains from that diminish. And so that's why you maybe might see that um, the best outcome might be a small individual payment plus a household based means tested top up. Thank you. And Annie makes a good point in the chat that um, it being paid to the individual is not necessarily the same as it being calculated on a household basis. So you could calculate it on a on a household basis, but ensure that every individual gets uh, their entitlement to their own income. Lena, do you have another question for us? I do. I'm going to bundle a couple of questions that we've been getting together. So sorry, you're not going to get to speak. So we've got uh, something from Reinhard and Kirsten about how do um, DRF and, and yourself, Donald, how, do, how does the enormous differences of living cost of living across the country figure into the MIG calculation for example like rent um and the figure given wouldn't be adequate in London for example so how does that figure into it or even um across I've, have there been calculations done across different countries and different economies um and that comes from Chris I wonder if we could just talk about those regional differences and how they they play into it and how they affect the dynamic yeah. of a minimum income guarantee well in some ways we're quite fortunate in this country in the sense that those costs which are regionally very different are very specific ones like rent and childcare, whereas things like food and clothing, for example, cost very similar amounts at because we have national um, chain stores. Um, and so, I mean, the present system does deal with that in a way that it would be very difficult if, if it was just a, a single um, basic income. 
um, and, and that is that, that it, it gives you an entitlement plus a, a rent which has a maximum according to where you live. And, and, and I actually think that is a good principle. Um, and so it's, it, you can adapt the, um, the, the present system. Um, our minimum income standard is does, we do across the country as a, as a single thing, but we also have a separate one for London. So there, there, are, there are some, um, there is some scope for, for regional variation, but really a lot of that does come from housing actually. Um, and so you can, you know, you can separate it out, but it's, it is, it is this problem, this general problem with basic income. It's also applies to things like disability, which is that, that it, it does create a one size fits all when actually needs a different. And so having the, one of the big challenges there has been is, is would you still have housing benefit? If you did, don't you then still have means testing? And if you didn't, then um, how do you account for the, the, the sort of very, very, it's not, and it's not just differences in regions it's, or even, even in individual locations, but in, according to whether you're, what kind of um, rent you pay, if you're what sector you're in. So it's really hard to have a single payment that, that covers that. Yeah. yeah, agreed. I think we, yeah, we tend to talk about basic income as yeah, one component of a wider social security system. So certainly housing, uh, housing costs in the UK it doesn't doesn't fit into a basic income, certainly not at the moment. But yeah, and I think this is again why we're really keen to explore the idea of where it fits within the, the wider social security system uh, this year. I think these points are really crucial and, and often overlooked. Uh, Ian, did you have anything you wanted to add on to, I mean, I, I guess that was uh, Donald's area. But <laughs> um, no, other than, yeah, I totally agree with that key point, particularly housing costs and disability um, costs. I just you don't see how um, that can be covered by a, a sim simple single payment. Thank you. Lena. Right. I'm trying to find who put this question into the chat um and i can't at the present moment so i'm going to ah, i found it here we are alan patterson um you asked a question in the q a um about how you would implement anything that looked like a basic income and, and that kind of point that ian was picking up at the end of uh, when he was talking about the level and, and what the quality of income is and, and what it looks like um in terms of efficacy of giving a smaller amount or um at the level of the minimum income guarantee alan do you want to come on and ask a question or do you want me to read out your question from the q a i can invite you to talk now you can unmute yourself uh, yeah that's uh, there we go that. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my, my basic point was, I mean, there's some great stuff tonight. Thank you um, for the speakers. And I like the idea of the sort of minimum income guarantee. But I think if you've got that as part of the package, why not start universal basic income now at a lower level? Because there are going to be flaws in the system. So I think I put in the QA, you know, why not start at 500 quid a month? You know, get it started and then discover all the wrinkles, uh, because I think there's a real danger. You know, there's some fantastic research going on, but we're not actually doing anything for the poor in this country. So, you know, let's get it started at 500 quid a month. Let's acknowledge that that's not adequate, but also acknowledge that we need to do something. And, uh, and once we've rolled that out, we can start to tweak it and, you know, hopefully raise it. And I think one of, you know, both your speakers go on and on about tax. That's just absolutely rubbish. There is no need to tax for a, a universal basic income at 500 quid. I mean, what you would do is you'd, you'd tag on to the, the people over 100k or whatever who start to lose the personal allowance. You just tag the, the basic income onto that, into that sort of um, uh, tapering of, of their tax allowance. And you could roll that out tomorrow. The furlough scheme proves that the government can make money when it wants to. So you could start at 500 quid uh, per person tomorrow and make it work. And then we could actually move things forward. Any reflections on this, on this suggestion? I, I kind of disagree with that, I'm afraid. Um, I mean, yes, you could, you could raise the um 
what is it now about sort of 300 and something pounds that a single person gets 500 pounds you'd have to find that money from from somewhere um and in the long term you need to, i mean you, it's all very fine saying make a start at, at, at something which isn't adequate but in the long term you have to have an idea about where that money is coming from and you know it, it's it's absolutely clear to me that you cannot fund something which is both adequate and universal um, simply by tackling the the richest part of the population. There's simply not enough money there. You know, even if even if people did work when they had 90% marginal tax rates, somewhere along the line, you're going to have to take money from people in the middle. I mean, it's just it's just you can just work it out. And and of course, you know, if you if you just made the system a little bit better and gave people a little bit, then that then that yes, that's true. But what is that a step towards? There's no point taking a step towards something if you don't have a coherent idea about how it's going to be paid for when you actually take the, the further steps. And, and I don't see what, I mean, it seems to me trying this thing out just sounds like adding a complexity because you still have means testing, you still have, um, you know, you, you then just have two different things that you had when you had one before. Um, and it just seems to do, go the opposite way than what the universal basic income is meant to be doing, which is simplify things. So, I mean, I, I, but I just think that there's been a lot in the chat about, look, if only you took money from the rich, you'd be able to afford this. That is just simply not the case if what you're talking about is an adequate payment for everyone, which allows everyone to live in dignity. You can't just get that by, by taxing the rich more. So can I just, I mean, I understand the points you're making, and I certainly uh, understand the point about I mean, fundamentally, I think we disagree that we need taxes to pay for this because the furlough scheme proves the government. But you can't do this furlough scheme forever, can you? No, I mean, that no, was... no, hold it, like, can I finish? Yeah. So what happens is, you know, there's a problem if you give the poorest in society uh, 500 quid and stick it in a tax haven because it doesn't get spent in the economy. But there's not a problem because these guys are going to go out and buy food. And when they buy food, they buy them from a local shop and the guy who runs the local shop pays his taxes and the people who make the food pay their taxes. So in, in about three to what well, who you believe, if you, uh, you know, talk to people like Richard Murphy, the government gets all of its money back in about four to five, maybe six transactions. So all you're doing is effectively an alternative form of QE. And I'd far rather be given 500 quid to the poorest in society than billions to bankers who nearly bankrupt the country. So I'm talking about taking the money that's already being spent. You know, it's not not being spent. QA is still going on. If you if you tot up all the QA, and I've done some work on this, and I'm planning to publish some information on it, hopefully later this year. If you take all the money that's been pumped in through QE and had turned that into basic income at the original crisis point in 2008, we would be in a much better position. And I disagree that we shouldn't start now, because by starting now, you learn, Thanks, what, the, you learn what the problem is. Thank you. you. You have to send those papers over to us and we'll, we'll make sure to circulate them when they're there. Thank you for the points. I think there's, there's sort of two sides to this, isn't there? We've, we've shifted slightly into the, um, the monetary financing proponent of, of the basic income debate, which is perhaps not the, the focus today. Um, I wonder, Ian, if you had any reflections on just the idea of starting at a lower level and um, giving, giving things a go, you know, sort of what are the practicalities of that from a policy design uh, perspective? I mean, there's risks associated too, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly risks and um, definitely have concerns about arguing for a basic income, full stop, but arguing for a very low one, just from the point of view, like from the risk of that that could potentially end up with everyone thinking it's fine um, to just have no other social security protection or anything because uh, we've given everyone a, a basic amount and that's fine um so that 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 is a risk um on the other side i think like you know there are examples where introducing a policy at sort of a small scale um it has been fundamentally um, successful in the long term. I mean, the main one I'm thinking of is, is the minimum wage, which was um, brought in, you know, was a highly contested 
policy concept um, until um, kind of until Labour, the Labour Party just just did it um, in in the nineties, um, and um, pretty sure most other the main parties were were against it the idea and said what a ridiculous idea it was but they introduced it um at a pretty you know fairly low level um uh, and years later suddenly the conservatives are the now the, the main champion of the policy and have raised the minimum wage to significantly higher levels um and you know that that happened that that was able to happen because someone brought it in at a much lower level to start with. And then it's much easier to kind of lever it up once you've got it in the system. So, you know, that's the other side of the, of the, of the argument for why you might want to try and do something at, at, at a small level. Um, it, you know, it, that's a bit different though to the kind of push for pilots and things that have been going on, which is sort of about answering certain questions about whether these things would work, um, I think. Um, but but you know that kind of thing is still valuable from a research perspective um others might think they are also valuable in terms of influencing policy because if you can get the more pilots you get going at something the more sort of normal it seems the more it seems like it, it's a valid concept that lots of um governments are doing so they could there i can definitely see a sort of um public or political shifting reason for doing pilots as well Thank you. Yeah, that's a long process of implementation, or like a lot of factors to consider through implementation. I think the implementation of universal credit is a prime example of, of the real human cost of, of poorly rolled out policies. Uh, Lena. Yeah, we're going to bring in um, Maria now, who has a couple, who has a question and a point. And then I hope we'll have time for one more. So I'm going to allow you to talk now. You should be able to unmute yourself. Right, OK. Can you hear us all right? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Right. But basically, what I want to discuss is the fact that people don't include, when we're talking about charging extra taxes to do a basic income, what we could do instead of extra taxes to get shot of all of the... They're paying £440 million in the court cases to stop disabled people claiming PIP. Right, that is 440 million that could be spent on universal basic income. Right, they're also spending a billion on Atos and things like that. Um, um, that could be removed. Right, that they also spend money on mental health services. Those people who are crashing mentally are requiring mental health services. That's money that's paid out of taxes. Those people need health services if you're not checked properly. Your health services come out of taxes, taxes to the NHS. If people are looked after, they don't need as much health care, they don't need the mental health care, they might need less, um, you know, there would be less wasted in the courts, there'd be less wasted on policing because there would be less crime, right? So the taxes, the actual UBI would pay for itself if it got shot of all of the punitive punishment and torture and psychological abuse that has been met out to claimants, right? Um, and I'm not talking about just a UBI, I'm talking about scrapping the system and redoing it to, to remove all of the stress. And yes, obviously it would be less than a regular paid job, Right, we all accept that, right? But if someone's disabled, they can't work. So they should get the same amount as a minimum wage job, right? Whether you're living on your own, within account of the fact that the fuel's going up 50, 54%. So that's like one question. Can we not count that as taxes that we would save in other areas? So therefore, UBI would pay for itself. Yes, it may cost jobs of people who are punishing people, but I don't think it's acceptable for people to be punished in the first place. It's against our human rights. The second point I wanted to make, um, was all of the corruption. So for instance, Shell, right? They paid Shell 100,000 pounds, 100 uh, million, sorry, 100,000, I think it was, right? Last year, and then Shell didn't pay any taxes and they made 12 billion profit, right? There's all this corruption and the government is selling everything in this country to other countries and other people. They've sold by um, National Grid to, um, to Austria recently. Um, they're now looking to sell Channel 4. They're basically selling everything not nailed down. So this country cannot recover from what this government is doing to it economically, right? And what we need to do is look at systems that don't punish people and don't cause mental ill health. I actually saw a guy trying to commit suicide by train. I actually got there just after he'd been pulled off the lanes off a group of lads and they were phoning for support for him. That's what this is leading to. I, I took overdoses twice myself because of stress. 
right? And I've also ended up in a, in a mental health unit, which costs a lot of money to run, for nearly five and a half months for psychosis, through being trapped in fight or flight, through the, the constant stress of worrying about getting put on universal credit when I live on my own, and I've got mental health problems, I've got autism, I've got degenerative prolapse disc disease and other things like that. And other people have got the same sorts of problems, right? I live on my own. I've got no support network. I've got no one. The transport here, you know, you can't even get an early bus in the morning. The first bus is half past seven, right, in the village. And we only get a half hourly service and then an hourly service. So people can't get the early jobs and stuff like that. We're being told to look for jobs that are inappropriate to our health. We're being told to look for insecure jobs when we live on my own, which would cause mental health stress for somebody who's autistic. Right, we're being punished and tortured and it needs to end. And the money needs to be put back into the system to look after people instead of punishing people. And that's my thought on it. And I think 80 pounds is definitely not enough, especially given that. Uh, the, the last quick point that I wanted to make was, um, I'm currently on PIP now, right? And I've looked at what's going to happen to me. me. Me gas and electric, I'm a real minimal user. I've only put the heating on twice this month and my bill is 43 pound, right? For a month, right? It's going to double because I'm, I'm not in the the cohort of getting the hate yet until, until uh, August because of my um, contract. But when it does hit, I'd be paying 80, so that's £20 a week, over £20 a week just to eat me house. And that's minimally in, in using me heater twice, you know what I'm saying? Um, I've done everything I can to cut down. I have to use a dryer because I'm upstairs and I, I kind of get my stuff up and downstairs, but I don't iron, so I make up for it that way, right? We're effectively taking a 5%, 5.5% or 6% cut Re-inflation, but that inflation is calculated over billionaires, and we're at the bottom of this, so we're actually effectively taking a fifty-nine percent cut with a fifty-four percent fuel hike, and the and the cost of food and everything's going to go sky high, and then we're going to have to take another cut again in October, right? So it's the same people, and now they've decided to take a warm home grant off with for disabled, and we're living a what they call a reasonable property. It took me. This is only the last four years I've had a reasonable property. Before that, I was denied and denied and denied at NEL. Right, I've gotten more and more discount, and now I'm not entitled to it because I'm on PIP. Now, PIP's not meant to be means tested, but that means testing PIP, and that's what's going on in this country. People are being psychologically tortured. That it's a eugenics cull plan. The government is doing nothing to help people, nothing at all, and pretending to the public that we we'll get loads of money and we don't. Right, thank Great. you. That's what I need. Thank to you say. very much. Just a massive thank you for sharing and being so candid about your personal experience. Yeah. Um, thank you for yeah making some really clear points about. As Ian says in the chat just there, the current system is not working. Um, thanks for being here tonight and taking the time to share that with us. Um, yeah, I mean, is there anything, any reflections from, from the panel that want to go back on any any of the specific? Could I just say that we, we, I completely agree with the point that she's making about how you can save an enormous amount of money by making sure people have decent incomes. And we've done work for the, um, for the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, another project I've done for them um, about the cost, the cost of poverty um, to the country. Um, and it's in the tens of billions. Um, and by having decent, a decent, unconditional um, guarantee of, of, of an adequate income, um, I completely agree that, that, that this, would, this would save tens of billions and pay for itself. The issue we have um, is whether you go for something where, where everybody gets something, including the people who are extremely well off to get the payment, which would not cost tens of billions, it would cost hundreds of billions. Um, and so I think we can, we, we, we're, all, we're all agreed that, that the present system is creating damage, um, which could be avoided if people had decent incomes. And what we're trying to do is to, is to find what, what is the best way actually to, to, to achieve that. Completely agree. And thanks, Maria, for sharing your experience. Sorry to hear about your experiences, but unfortunately, it, it, it's it's too common amongst um, many people that that we work with um, at JRF, um, and particularly, yeah, the 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 the, the, fee, the way that the, the the current social security system and other and some other services treat people, um, not really as 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 people as human beings, really, um, and that that lack of dignity there. Um, and the stress that causes um, on mental health. And, and so, as Donald says, completely agree that ultimately that, you know, that has costs that hit um, our um, other services um, and, and people's ability to, um, to live out their lives in dignity and, and fulfill their potential and everything else. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of pick up on the 
the sort of tax point that I think a couple of people, the speakers have mentioned and just kind of just say why I stuck to talking about kind of um, the raising of income tax. Um, and that's because in a way I see that as a fair sort of baseline comparison to do because fundamentally um, you can view the tax and benefit system as sort of as one. They're, they're both about tr uh, individual, they're transfers of income between different households. And um, so you can sort of view a, a universal basic income as a kind of just a restructuring of our tax system. Um, you're sort of, rather than having something that, um, a, a sort of tax system that um, taxes people at relatively low marginal rates, um, you 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 sort of restructure it, and you have a tax system that includes basically a kind of a flat um, uh, tax credit, essentially that's refundable to everyone, plus some higher marginal rates. Um, the, 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 like it's, it's a completely valid point that um, you don't have to raise taxes just by income tax, but which is true, but but when you start talking about other ways of raising the money to balance that budget, even if it's wealth taxes or um, environmental taxes um, would obviously be a good one. It's probably the only sort of taxes on bad things, basically. Um, all other taxes that, you know, have some um, other negative impacts probably on, on the economy, but um, then you're sort of disconnecting it. You're coming away from it being a, a sort of restructuring and making the tax system more redistributive and um you raise the question of um well okay well we're going to raise some taxes from environmental levies um, but then there will be choices then about there's a huge opportunity cost about what you spend that money on and um it, you know you might people want to spend that money on improving the health system or they will you know there was lots of problems with our health system lots of problems with our education system that caused lots of issues um and just all of the kind of again i think the public opinion and uh, public attitude stuff kind of just shows that unfortunately people um where they are open to raising more in taxes the, the sort of spending that back on social security payments it's just so far down the list and they want they would rather spend that money on things like the health service um so that's why i sort of think it's fair to just sort of pick say you know how much would income taxes need to rise um to, when when viewing um basic income proposals because it, it's fundamentally a redistribution and just on the points about kind of monetary financing um that's just it's just a it's just an illusion really um you've got to forget about money um you're talking about you know our economy we as people uh, produce resources and we as a society kind of agree how to distribute those resources just forget about the money and universal basic income proposals at high levels are fundamentally a big restructuring, a big redistribution of how we as a society want to share those resources. And that's why it's inevitable if you put that in terms of income tax terms, it's why you see that you do need um, quite high levels of income tax across the population because it's just such a fundamental, fundamentally big redistribution of our resources and no sort of um, money illusion can change that. I agree. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's well, I it's important. Agree much there, Sorry. <laughs> I was trying to not agree with people, but yeah. <laughs> too, too camaraderie. Yeah, I think it's, it's important to consider what an entirely new system would look like, you know, if we were inventing it from scratch, how we would do it better and to, you know, that's the end point we're trying to get to, but we also need to work out uh, how we how we find our entry point and, and which steps we, we start taking uh, today. Um, Donna, did you have anything you wanted to add to that in more detail than agree? Do you agree with all of it? <laughs> no, no, I agree. With, I agree with the thing about money. I'm afraid that saying that we, we did, we, we paid people to do nothing during the pandemic. And so we can just print money is, is I just think that's wrong. I mean, as is, as is, I mean, quantitative easing was at a particular moment and it was all on the basis that it was going to be paid back. If you print money and don't, don't produce goods and services, then you have fewer goods and services. And you actually eventually have inflation, which is what we're having now. 
which I think is not disconnected with the fact that we needed to um, we needed to effectively do that for a time to pay people to do nothing. You then have more money around and and less and 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 no more goods and services. So you know it just isn't an answer. And I agree with Ian that that it's it's a bold proposition for redistribution um, rather than something you can just conjure up. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So, oh, sorry, Lena, you carry on. No, unless you had a point. No, okay. Um, I noticed um, there's been a lot, there's been circling around this idea of public opinion. Um, and Liz Bale, you put some comments in the chat about um, changing public opinion and your experiences on the doorstep. I wondered if you wanted to come in briefly and uh, have, ask a question on that. No? Oh, hello. <laughs> hello. Hello, we can hear you. Hi, yeah, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry if I'm breaking up on you. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been uh, campaigning for Labour for quite a few years now, and I, I did stand for Parliament um, for North West Hampshire in 2019. And over the years, I've done a lot of uh, talking to voters on doorsteps about all sorts of issues, benefits and so forth. And I've actually touched on, you know, I've explored the issue of UBI with people. And there is sort of considerable resistance to it because they just fundamentally dismiss it as being a handout to the rich and you don't get sort of much further in the conversation than that whereas if I've, I've started to say well how would you start to feel about topping up an income to a minimum income level and they see that as being targeted to people who actually need it then they're much more receptive does that make sense can you hear me no, it does make sense. Um, and I think it's it's not something that's unfamiliar to the basic income conversation either. So I wonder if if um, Ian or, or Donald, you had comments on the kinds of things, because Donald, you've already kind of addressed that this is the, you, you don't address that specific points to avoid sowing division. But I wondered if you could say something on if there has been things that you've found as workarounds or ways to approach this discussion. Uh, sorry, can you tell me what you mean by workarounds? Yeah, so you, you said before that approaching how you fund the minimum income standard has been a real source of division, um, and that's what you've avoided in the consultation process. But as we're hearing from Liz, you know, this is a very contentious thing, and as we know, we work on the issue, it's a very contentious thing. And I wondered if there are ways that you had found to talk about minimum income standards that um, kind of do make sense to people and do resonate with people and don't immediately um, breed those divisions. Yeah, well, I, I think that, um, I mean, Ian's, the, the Roundtree has looked at how you frame these things. And actually, I think talking about, I think that one of the most powerful things about the basic income is about providing some form of stability and certainty that, that people at the moment just don't have. And it's very easy to see, and, and we can see it much more with COVID and now the living standards inflation crisis, how the biggest problem that people have is just that uncertainty. And I think that I think that using some of these ideas to adapt the, the, the benefit system to give people more stability by saying, I mean, we used to have a, um, something called um, family credit, which would sort of be awarded for six months and it, it wouldn't be changed, you know, and just bringing in some of those things which where, where people can recognize how, how, how much people with unstable jobs, sometimes in work, sometimes out of work, need that stability. Um, I think it's a good time to do that because everyone can see why it's needed. Um, so, I mean, I, I do agree about, about, building, um, about, about building on things and showing what can be done. But for me, it's about those sorts of things um, rather than sort of taking some small amount that you give to somebody, which isn't going to be enough that you're, you're then going to have to have to give a means to top up to. It's much more about saying the entitlements which you do have to start with, give, it, give them on a more stable basis. And, and also, of course, working towards improving, improving their level. And, and we did have an experiment with that called the 20 pound top up of, of universal credit. I mean, the problem was that it was taken away. You know, so we need we need to try to build um, build on adequacy and build on stability. And, and I think that people will see the benefits to everybody of that. Yeah, yeah. Ian, do you have something to add for that? Yeah, I think 
the the 20 pound uplift of universal credit is just an indicator of the, 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 how tough <laughs> this world is um for um for, for for people that have campaigned in this space like the jrf has on the on the 20 pounds um just just to even retain something that was put in just to just to give a little bit more adequacy to our current system um one thing that's always always dismayed me a little bit from our framing research is um how difficult social security is uh, as a as a thing um for the public um and our framing research kind of its advice basically was don't talk about benefits um it was the most productive way um to talk about what poverty is is to talk about yeah those kind of common values that that we all agree on and why it's unjust um about how we are all a comp compassionate um society we want a just society and um to talk about the like the problem really um and not to not to not to be tempted as campaigners say on social security to start to go in with social security um it kind of turns people off straight away so uh, i was trying if i try and read that across to sort of people who who would want to campaign for basic income say maybe don't go in with the view that um and start talking about basic income as the entry point because people will be turned off straight away and it's talk about what it is what's the change you want to see like what is the problem um what do we all agree on uh, and and position a bit of basic income in your case as 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 a, as a solution and why that's a solution to that yeah, I think coming in with solutions is a strange rarity um, <laughs> this, in this day and age. Um, just as we're touching on the idea of minimum income guarantee or how perhaps that's um, maybe more palatable or yeah, slightly different. I wondered if we could talk a bit more about the work in Scotland and uh, yeah, I mean, just talk a little bit about how minimum in income guarantee compares briefly as we've only got a couple more minutes. Uh did you want well i mean it's 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 fairly simple that that, that it's it's the same idea it, it's trying to give to, to give something unconditional to everyone but it's targeting it by by income so yeah it's saying so it's different from the present system in the sense that you don't have the conditionality but it's the same in the sense that you do have means testing and you know i mean i can see why People, I mean, easy about that, but it's it's a it, it's a compromise which the Scots came to when they when they looked at it closely. Yeah, I mean, I think I've seen actually a broader conception of a minimum income guarantee, and it's exactly why we've got a, probably a bit of a fudge in Scotland in terms of um, the Scottish government. Actually, you know, um, it's well, it, it purports to ultimately want to bring in a basic income. Uh, but instead, it's um, it's the manifesto pledge was um, with sort of well, it's it's actual it's pledge from in government has been around a minimum income guarantee, which it sort of said is a starting it is is a framework within which to ultimately get to a basic income. Um, I don't know, I genuinely don't know how genuine they are about that, um, but I, I suspect it's 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 tackling some internal tensions about um, about um different wings of the party that maybe want to want to basic income and those that don't but but they're able to get there because the concept of a minimum income guarantee i'd say is basically just it's, it's fundamentally a principle that there's just a level below which no one in our society should should fall and and all of our policy should should ensure that um and a basic income is one mechanism for achieving that if you if you have a basic income then you have implemented a, a minimum income guarantee you've just implemented it very simply with 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 a with with a payment that doesn't vary but um so that's why probably the scottish government have to have got this kind of fudged moment where some people think they're working towards a basic income and others don't realize that they are or um or or, or they some they um, they've allowed this constructive ambiguity so that they can allow some people to think they, that that's what they've said, but others not. Um, but yeah, um, but fundamentally, a minimum income guarantee is, as I see it, is just a principle. Um, and actually, our current system, like, is a version of a minimum income 
guarantee. Um, you start with a basic universal credit allowance and that you know gets tapered off as you earn more. The, 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 the crucial point where it's not is that some people can, um, can um, have that taken away because of conditions. And that's probably the key starting difference that you could make. Um, the other is that um, obviously eligibility is restricted and there are lots of people who aren't entitled even to universal credit. Um, many different examples, but a clear example from it is people um, without recourse to public funds. Um, so people who may be born um, in another country have got um, an immigration status that um, isn't regular. So, um, but, but again, that's just, a, you, could, you could change our current system. You could allow people with no recourse to public funds to access the universal credit system. And that would, again, provide, that would strengthen the minimum guarantee that we've sort of got. Um, so I think it's just to say that it's quite a broad principle of minimum income guarantee. Um, basic income is, is just potentially one way of achieving it. Fabulous. Oh, well, this takes us well slightly past 7.30. Sorry for, for going over time, everybody. But I just want to say a massive thank you to Donald and Ian and to everyone in the chat and the Q&A today was a particularly lively discussion tonight, which has been very enjoyable. Um, I see some uh, slight uh, frustration in the chat that this was not the broadest of conversations and that indeed is the point. This is one of our seminars, which has got quite a specific focus. Tonight, we focused on the minimum income standard We'll announce our next event with a uh, specific focus in a few weeks, but we do also do the big basic income conversations every quarter, so we will send a link out to that in the follow up email to this so you can join and, and it will be a much broader discussion and a much uh, more inclusive and involved discussion. And uh, th these are all online events as well. We do them every quarter. And we do, of course, also have our Basic Income Conversation Toolkit where you can host your own conversations with uh, the people that you want to speak to about basic income through whatever lens it is that you find most interesting. So we're doing our best to enable all of those conversations that you want to have. Uh, but thanks again for being here this evening. I'm going to let you go and enjoy that evening. And yeah, we'll send over a follow up email shortly with, with the link to this recording of this session if you want to watch it back and some other resources. Thank you, good night everyone.